Through the desolate summits swept raging and intermittent gusts of the terrible Antarctic wind, whose cadences sometimes held vague suggestions of a wild and half-sentient musical piping with notes extending over a wide range and which, for some subconscious mnemonic reason, seemed to me disquieting and even dimly terrible. mountains of madness whose farther slopes looked out over some accursed ultimate abyss. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the IMMP, the Intermillennium Media Project podcast. My name is Matthew Porter. And I am Ian Porter. <laughs> <laughs> I'm his dad, he's my son, and uh, you know, trying to change the mood a little bit. It's still the very cold winter here. Yes. So uh, last time, you know, I tried Ice Station Zebra. That didn't do it. No, we need something a little warmer. So now we decided, well, if if going north didn't work, I decided I would have Ian uh, join me in a trip south, <laughs> way south. <laughs> way south. To the Antarctic with that bundle of laughs, H.P. Lovecraft. Oh, goodness. We're talking about the H.P. Lovecraft novella, at the Mountains of Madness. Have we discussed any Lovecraft in the past? Oh, yes, we have. We've we have. We've did the movie of Dunwich Horror. Right. We've never really talked about Lovecraft's fiction in its own right. But we did talk about Lovecraft, and we did watch that, um, that adaptation of one of his best-known stories, Partly because of the influence I think it had on Ghostbusters. Yes. Which I could absolutely, yeah. But I don't know if I've gotten you to read any Lovecraft before this, but I knew I had to at some point because <laughs> issues with his work notwithstanding, it had a tremendous influence on me for many years. Oh, this is another one of those things I can easily catalog in the, well, that explains part of Dad's bookshelf when I was growing up. There's a few things about just <sighs> about the way these stories are made. There's a lot to be said negative about H.P. Uh, Lovecraft as a man. And there's a lot of positive, I think, that can be said about his impact on media and culture, I must say, yeah, also. And I think we'll touch on all of those during conversation about him. But I... in terms of how these are actually structured, it was a little wild to me. Because I swear, it didn't feel like this was an old book. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, to give everyone a bit of context, I used the audiobook version for this. Which did you listen to? Because they're, I believe they're in public domain now. So there are a lot of different, both print editions, e-editions, and audio editions of his work. I used the recording of it narrated by John Bennett, which I was able to get from our local library. Cool. I've got an audiobook version that I haven't listened to yet, but it's available free from the H.P. Lovecraft Historical Society. They've released it uh, as part of some kind of an anniversary celebration. And I haven't listened to it yet, but the other things I've gotten from the H.P.L. Historical Society, like their movie version of Call of Cthulhu, their movie of Whisper in Darkness, and their audio drama version of the Dunwich Horror, uh, are all very good, so I have high hopes for this um, uh, for this audiobook of Out the Mountains of Madness. I reread the book uh, for this, so I think it's interesting that we'll have different takes on it. Yeah, there's a but there's a lot about the way that it's structured as this because the entire the entire book is not done in a in a during the narrative style. It is all framed as a letter pleading to the public to not support and call for the cancellation of a another trip to the antarctic right it's you know it's it's a big no please don't go and mm -hmm. i can tell you this because i went already yeah and that's, i i kind of want to break this into three chunks of a story and chunk 1 is the science is cool stop it <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's not really an epistolatory novel because it's not an exchange of letters but it's like one long letter to the editor yes and 
the the first section is just a giant as you know bob <laughs> because he's essentially well i shouldn't have to restate all of the things that have already been made public in my earlier reports and he lays out all of the things that have already been publicly reported about the expedition that our narrator previously led uh, in the Antarctic to perform geologic and possibly paleontological explorations using some experimental drilling equipment and five airplanes. This was for the 1920s. That's a big that's a big case. Of and this is very high tech. They yeah. Had airplanes and radios and cutting edge experimental drilling equipment. This was a, a very expensive and very high tech expedition that our narrator previously led. Yeah. And this, this was written, I believe this novella is from 1931. So, and that's fairly late in. Lovecraft's bibliography. So. Uh, yeah, this was, it was written in 31, and it was serialized in the 1936 issues of Astounding Stories, only to be reprinted in full collections later. So this is, is talking about an expedition that must have taken place quite a few years earlier in the 1920s. Mm -hmm. And that puts an interesting context around it, because even the narrator is looking back at what had happened previously. Actually, it's set in the 1930s, in September oh. of 1930. Well, it's set then. Yes. That's when the letter is being written? No, that's when the, ex the events of a, of a disastrous expedition to Antarctica in September of 1930. Oh, so... I always took this as the the new expedition that was being planned was in the early 1930s, around when the, the novella was written. So it must be talking about an, a, an earlier expedition from the 1920s. So he is giving you, he's looking back from the future. Yeah, he's, he's setting this a year after, he's, he wrote it a year after when it's set. He wrote it in 31. It's set in 30. It wasn't published till 36, but that gives it this. It's been a couple of years since this thing, the popular story of the fact that we did this and things came back badly have gone around and now they're attempting it again. Stop them. You described it as an as you know, Bob earlier. And it's like, as you know, Bob, he is a mad raving lunatic. That is the Bob we know. But we've never told you what drove Bob to this, and I will finally break the silence because we cannot allow this to pass again. <laughs> oh, that that is interesting. That puts a different perspective on it. I mean, it's not huge, but it is an interesting, an interesting different perspective. It's still describing this cutting edge, high tech mission to the Antarctic. Yeah, and, and they've it, got two ships. Oh, and it's all being it's all under the auspices of. Uh, Miskatonic University of Arkham, Massachusetts. Uh, of course, everything goes to there. But yeah, geolo geologist William Dreyer is kind of sending out this message about how this, yes, our group of scholars from Miskatonic did this, don't do it again. And yeah, that first part is so technical. This is about like how many planes will make how many stops at where to build what base camp at what time, who will stay behind. It starts out with this long ex discussion of this drilling system and this tool to use to get there. Like and I these think core samples they're taking. It's it is. You're right. It, it's it's so detailed. And I think that's part of part of it is padding out this long story that's longer than most of what Lovecraft wrote. But also some of it is very much in the what was what was hot in the science fiction market at the time and science fiction leaned much more heavily into the science in the early part of the 20th century, where it, it was this combination of travel log and vicarious engineering thrills by hearing about all of this equipment and the airplanes and how they were staging where the fuel was being stored and all of this. Those details, they must have been really interesting to people for whom aviation and Arctic exploration and even even you know advanced two-way radios were this interesting cutting edge stuff. 
what if after the show ended, someone wrote a message about how Marty and Rick Lagina had gone too far and should not be emulated? <laughs> That's kind of what this is. <laughs> There's You're all right. this information about how they're going to do it. There's all this technical, how you do the drilling, how you do the the base prep. It's very much Oak Island. It is. And I do keep expecting <laughs> to find the discovery of a northern colony of, of great old ones somewhere in Oak Island. That heck, that would be a heck of a season. That would be. <laughs> that'd, be that'd be two seasons. They could stretch that one. <laughs> really, the, the, the first part, which is... I'm going to reiterate the official report you've already all heard is this this mission that had all the backing it needed, all the technology it needed. It started off very promising and then the larger part of the expedition was pinned down somewhere where there was terrible terrible weather and it destroyed most of their supplies and took the lives of many of the crew and Everybody else got their way back to their two ships and was able to escape. Mm hmm. Sad story of a mission that hit a lot of bad luck. And then he goes into because that apparently isn't enough to stop you fools from going back to the Antarctic with even more high tech stuff to melt the ice and do all kinds of additional drilling. Now I need to tell you what really happened. And hopefully this is going to scare you to your senses. Exactly. And there's a whole lot of interesting stuff where, like, in, in his descriptions of how they were being prepped and such, you can kind of hear our narrator getting excited. There's this pride to what they tried that still hasn't completely faded, in my opinion. There's this little bit of, like, because he'll go on these long strings about this technology, about how prepared they were, how good this was. And then he'll stop and reiterate the don't do it. And then have to explain why, and then get into another. It's like there's this little bit of that adventurer that didn't die, on, and that's a scary thing to him because it keeps on making him slide back, and that's why he's trying to pull everyone and himself included from making this foolhardy choice. And that's nice in two ways. It makes the story more engaging to read when someone is excited about what it is they're telling you, but it also makes Dreyer... A more relatable character. This is this mission was still probably the most important thing. It was terrible, but it was the most important thing he was involved in in his career. And having to recount all these details brings back some of that old excitement, except for occasionally when he realizes, no, wait a minute, my reason for telling all of this is to stop it from happening again. It it does manage to make this narrator an interesting character, which can be hard to do when you have a, a narration that it's a first person narration, but it is a, such a distant first person narration. There's no real dialogue to speak of. There's not a lot of direct uh, observation of other characters. It's hard to make that engaging. And yet tricks like that are what enable Lovecraft to do it. And there's some interesting things about also what he pulls in because it works all on its own for those reasons. But he also has a lot of fun referencing things and pulling stuff in, I think. And that's oh, another thing that'll much. grab you and draw you in as an audience. Yeah, apart from his own referencing his own stuff, and we'll talk about that in more detail. So much of this is inspired by uh, Edgar Allan Poe. Yes. And you know, Arthur Gordon Pym, mm -hmm. uh, which, of course, had all kinds of influence on, on Lovecraft and others. Even though... That was never regarded by anyone, including Poe, as one of Poe's particularly strong works. It did. It was more of an adventure story. It was, it was about this sailing expedition that eventually made its way towards the Antarctic. Mm -hmm. And it opened the door to a certain kind of adventure story that Lovecraft is attempting here. It does. And it's interesting to map the first part of this, uh, this novella, what the official report has been, and then to kind of map the day-by-day -day account we get in the second part, mm -hmm. giving you details that they had all, all sworn to secrecy about or, or didn't want to divulge for fear of being called mad about what really happened on the expedition, what really went wrong. And as he starts to tell about more stuff, one of the things that leapt out to me immediately 
the Dunwich Horror was written and takes place before the Mountains of Madness. And why is that important? Because H.P. Lovecraft built a continuous universe. Absolutely. It is not a new thing. Marvel didn't invent it. <laughs> Movie franchises didn't invent it. H.P. Lovecraft was doing it before because everybody on this trip seems to have read that copy of the, of the Necronomicon and some of the other crazy books that Miskatonic has gathered over the years, and they seem to take it more seriously than they used to because <laughs> someone shot an invisible thing that exploded a barn and everyone <laughs> seems to have it on their reading list now is the best i can figure out because everything winds up getting related these opalescent things that remind me of this book i wish i had never read this old book in the library at the university because it's putting all these weird ideas into my head because so when i saw saw this thing in the Antarctic, I immediately thought of these bizarre monsters. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the five of us in the plane flinched. Luckily, our pilot never read the thing, so he seemed immune, just disturbed. <laughs> and that's where the narration is a little bit restrained mm -hmm. to make the novella interesting, where the, the narrator is not leaping ahead to share what he knows because of what happens later. He's limiting what he describes to how he responded to it when he first heard of it. Yes. Like, they get these radio calls from the geologists who are have gone on ahead and are digging up these things that are, wow, we have fossilized evidence of life in geologic strata that are millions and millions and millions of years older than any previous understanding of when life originated on Earth. And the narrator gives us his... Oh, here's this was amazing, and I was thrilled. I was disappointed. I'm not the one who discovered yeah. it, but I was so happy for him we and were for our expedition. Yeah, we're so excited. We're going to be rich and famous. <laughs> Yay! Now, some of that, I think he's got a very academic reserve about the way he's he's describing this, so it fits with the character of Dreyer, as we know him from the narr narration. But it's also a great way to make the novella interesting because we get the information in little bits and pieces and the few times he does get to break that kind of referential in the moment he does a good job of the like we were excited and delighted and it was going well we were so naive and then <laughs> yes. keeps going if I, only we knew then if only we knew then and <laughs> nowadays that might feel cliche i admit but that's because it was so good here and so good in the things this was calling back to that it has been rep repeated even more since then <laughs> and there are, are a few times where you know just you're reading along the description of this mission and then you get to a, a point like that you know little did we know that we would discover and that, oh that's right this is a lovecraft story i'm not just <laughs> reading some scientific yeah. travelogue from the yeah. 30s oh yeah this is gonna go badly isn't it it turns out that what was discovered by this advanced team who was, was doing extensive drilling and blasting and pulled up a bunch of stuff in addition to, they were kind of following the trail of the, the very incredibly old fossils that they were finding. And they got to a place where they drilled into a giant cave or void and pulled up all kinds of things. They had been pulling up, in addition to fossils, what appeared to be like very, very old pieces of stone that had markings on them. Mm -hmm. Like, gee, this is weirdly regular for a fossil, and we're seeing them repeated. And then they finally start breaking up these organisms. Yeah. These weirdly preserved, barrel-shaped things with kind of five-pointed heads. And some of them are damaged, some of them are strangely intact. None of them seem to have undergone true fossilization. They've just kind of been yeah. frozen and preserved, and they haven't it's had like, their material yeah. replaced by minerals. Yeah, it's like they seem to be, like, semi-solid, but they're kind of also still squishy. <laughs> and there's this very, very clear moment to me where I could almost feel the, you know, scientist, what am I even looking at? Poke, poke. <laughs> there's oh, very yes. much that, like, like... Oh, this is foolish. I like because there's also plenty of moments where they he intersperses like, well, we dyno we drilled a hole, we couldn't get big enough thing up, so we dynamited it, and this is what we got <laughs> left. And it's like, oh, you fool! It's like 
I know that's probably how it was actually done more around that time, but it hurts nowadays a bit Doesn't more. It? It's like, oh, you didn't. Oh, uh, yeah. And even through all this, we're hearing from Dreyer what Dreyer heard over the radio about this kind of hour by hour reporting about, or here's what we found. Here's the other thing we found. Here's what we did with it. Here's how many of them we brought to the surface. Here's what we dis- here's which one we decided to dissect. Yeah. And here's what we found when we dissected it. And here's how the dogs started not liking the fact that we were doing that. <laughs> yes. If there is one thing that should be taken to heart by anybody involved in a horror story that's set in the Arctic or Antarctic, Listen to the dogs. Listen to the dogs. The dogs are wise and smart. If they are really unhappy with something, they're probably right, and it's probably going to try to eat your face. (laughs) This this entire book could have been titled At the Mountains of Good Boy, and it would have just been, (laughs) I understand, let's leave. And it's fine. It's a very short novella. Very short novella. Much better. (laughs) But of course, shortly after these things are brought up, and the, the reports of what we've discovered from the dissections, the, the radio reports stop. Yeah. And yet, Dreyer and the others are still excited about what this is and concerned for their friends. But they're really excited about what this could possibly be. So they make their way to that camp and essentially find the wreckage of it. Yeah, it's been devastated. Most of the, the personnel are dead. And most of, the, uh, most of the dogs are dead. There's one person and one dog that are missing and unaccounted for. And the way that everything's dead, the way everything's been ransacked is disturbing and creepy and odd. There's a description about, like, cans attempting to, like, dented and damaged and opened, but never in the right way. And I'm like, how are you doing good prop horror yes. in a book? <laughs> Some of the, the, the cold weather equipment, like the furs, have been cut and torn in ways that suggest they were trying to be adapted in some inexplicable manner. Yeah. And the, the barrel-shaped things that were found and brought to the surface have all been buried very carefully mm-hmm. in this upright burial posture with markings that are similar to what was found on some of the stones. Yeah. <laughs> And not as many as had been reported discovered. Which is also creepy. (laughs) So, of course, Dreyer and uh, and one of his uh, his graduate students, they, they lighten up one of their planes and they take it up and try to get beyond the mountains at the foot of which is this base. And these are the mountains. Yeah. Previously, we'd had a little hint of something because somebody saw this weird vision in the sky above this mountain range, and they realized it was some kind of a weird mirage where you get ice crystals up above the mountains being kicked up by wind, and things are reflecting off the ice crystals. And of course, those ice crystals are going to be, uh, uh, th- those, those reflections are going to be very distorted. So, you know, some natural geologic formation might suddenly appear to be a weirdly geometric regular city type structure it's just a natural trick of the light exactly no (laughs) no because when they fly over the mountain range they find this weirdly geometric enormous city-like structure Mm -hmm. and so what do you do when you find this after everyone's dead you go inside and this is a there's a great tension here because all of the different motivations that are affecting Dreyer. He, he wants to f- see if maybe he can find his missing, uh, a missing man. And this is an amazing scientific discovery. And we really shouldn't be here. This is scary. But yeah. that last one never wins out. Never wins out. But having arrived at the titular mountains of madness, which have been called that now multiple times. <laughs> yes. Our hero... <laughs> uh decides to go inside and finds a lot more about the things that were uncovered earlier. And this is where we get some of it is an architecture lesson where we get these wonderful baroque lovecraftian descriptions of the city and the way it's built. And we also get lots and lots and lots of history lesson. 
Yeah. So this dryer and his buddy are in there with their 10 hours of flashlight batteries, and they find all of these sculptures, which they, re on the walls of this, of these, these chambers and these buildings that are all stuck together. It's not like a city with buildings and roads in between. It's yeah, like it's a, more like a, a maze agglomerated together. Yeah, it's like a, it, it's kind of described like a, uh, a mausoleum made out of prefab blocks. And for the most part, it looks like it was intentionally and carefully evacuated. There's not a lot of stuff left behind, mm -hmm. not furniture and all these things. But there are these sculptures, which they realize are a very popular form of narrative. Yeah, I, I do like the, I, I, I appreciate the hand wave of the, we studied this and somehow we understood them. Yeah, that's, it's this like, is where he loses immediately. This is a little, it's like, oh, I understand. And he kind of relays to you a history summarized YouTube video, but about <laughs> the old ones and their political intrigue. The detail of the, the history and biology and cosmology and politics and sociology of these creatures the detail that he got just from the pictures in these bas-relief sculptures over the course of five hours, having never seen anything like this before in his entire life, it's, it's, it's kind of ridiculous, but I'll roll with it for the, because it is so interesting to read. Last time on the <laughs> wing. <laughs> I mean, it's literally just an entire political drama episode. <laughs> done in this entire long sequence the middle of this book is the socioeconomic systems of the ancient things from the stars which is really weird because there's so many moments that actually make them too relatable they are and these are of course the weird barrel shaped things with the five pointed star shaped heads that those are the inhabitants and the builders of this city They're, yeah and they apparently were hibern in hibernation, and some of them were alive when they were, were brought up. And those are the ones that destroyed the camp and, and escaped. But we get, like, the entire history. And when I say history, I don't mean, uh, like, the last 200 years since somebody wrote a constitution. I mean millions and millions of years. Like, what, everything that's happened since they came down from outer space... And and they 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 build civilizations. They have small fights with their own like councils and with their like race of genetically optimized workers. The Shoggoths. The Shoggoths. They fight off another group of other space creatures that show up, start trying to get in the way, and they make a peace treaty with them, <laughs> and then keep going about their stuff. And then get smacked with climate change and have to change where they live. And this is what's interesting about some of Lovecraft's cosmicism. Yeah. The, the, this idea that the, the, the universe is so vast and it cares nothing about us. We are tiny and insignificant. That there are these multiple factions of things greater than us from beyond. There are things like the old ones, like these, these creatures that built this city, who are sort of the... The rational, technological, they're just super advanced. And they are spreading through the universe and colonizing it. And, and I say technological, but apparently they don't need spaceships. They can harden themselves against space and, and drift <laughs> through the cosmos on their giant leathery wings. But there are those. And then there are the the great old ones like Cthulhu, who does is name-checked in yes. this story. And the 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 Migo from uh, from Pluto, and all these different factions with different degrees of paranormal ability and just technical expertise and different agendas, and like Earth is in the crossfire, but Earth doesn't really matter. Yeah, It's it's just kind of weird. It turns the entire planet into, like, one speck of land they're fighting over. But you also get to feel this strange, like, 
oh, I hope they don't lose this place. Wait, why am I thinking about it? They're here. We're in their <laughs> yes. giant ancient city, somehow understanding this, and they just killed our team. Why am I worried about their politics? He does really make it engaging that yes. this is a story that we, we get into, even though it's being told at third hand by this scientist who's figuring it out from sculptures that he's looking at. And I think it shows that Lovecraft had written so much of this kind of thing before. So much of this was already in his head, in his stories about Cthulhu and about the Migo and about um, a yogg sothoth and all of this. And Shoggoths, that, they're right. still roaming. He's bringing all of this together. In some ways, he's, he's going back to the material he's already written, but he's giving it an interesting kind of distance because now we're seeing it once removed from one of the kinds of beings that was actually involved. Mm -hmm. And that's a very different approach. So much of Lovecraft is, well, I'm a mere human and I have absolutely no understanding of this, so all I can do is give you my pitiful attempt at description. Here, we're getting more detail because it didn't, the story isn't really a human story. Yeah. It makes it such that going back to other stories after reading At the Mountains of Madness, you've got context. And suddenly those become small pieces in the chronology of after all of this. And you understand why this thing is upset and where it is, what it's trying to do in a way you didn't before. And that's weird and interesting. This is why, even though I really like Call of Cthulhu, I really love the Dunwich Horror, I often come back to At the Mountains of Madness as maybe my favorite Lovecraft story. But I have to admit, that's not necessarily because it stands so well in its own, but because it pulls together so many things so well. Mm -hmm. But we've spent our time, we have gone through the entirety of the the history of the old ones and figured out why what's going on with them here. And now it's a problem that we're still in here. Right. And the last thing that happened with the old ones was, as you mentioned, Ian, there's climate change. They essentially had to, they had spread out over a lot of the world, and then they contracted back to their main base in Antarctica. And then they had to go down to this underground ocean because it was their only hope of having something like a stable environment. And they can adapt to all kinds of different environments. Most of their cities are under the sea anyway. So that's kind, it seems like that's why they evacuated this city. A lot of them have to move closer to work and get a new apartment. <laughs> You know, you know, those shug offs are not going to manage themselves. Exactly. <laughs> Imagining trying to, trying to manage shug offs by a Zoom. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, you don't need the extra appendages today. Stop that. <laughs> if only three of your heads are in focus. Can you get the other two onto the camera? <laughs> so simultaneously, we get the explanation as to why this city seems to have been evacuated. And then the question, are they still down there? They went down to this underground ocean to build a new city there and so that they could survive. And that's the last report of the one of the, in the city above ground. Right. So maybe they succeeded. Yeah, there is something a little bit reading the old one's diary about the whole, uh, the whole midsection. It's like, right. <laughs> Dear diary, I'm headed underground. I might not get to update you again later. Hopefully we're going to stay warm and okay and we'll rise again once we can assume the proper yeah. form. <laughs> it's like, oh. <laughs> and it's not quite you're reading the diary and the last pages and then someone read my diary and I had to deal with them. <laughs> but it's almost, it almost has that feel like, oh my gosh. This says they might still be downstairs. Yes, exactly. The call is coming from inside <laughs> the planet. So that leads to the next part of the story, which is more travel through this city. But now they're trying to find, they're trying to follow a map that they found to get to one of the entryways to <laughs> the subterranean city, the, sub, the subterranean ocean. And it's... It gets frantic at the end here because of all of the running and the things they start to smell and all these other sensor senses and panic and worry that comes through. But yeah, it's interesting how you go from this sterile, icy cold into 
you're right, more smells being described, more textures being described. And and more is not better in this environment. And they do find the missing people and the missing dogs. They do. Not good. Not in good shape. And they find a little camp. Yeah. That had been made with you know, a, a, a gasoline stove and some other supplies that had been stolen from the, the, uh, the encampment that was destroyed. So this was kind of an organized attempt to gather some supplies and find our people again. Seems to be what was the, the motivation of the, the, the old ones that, that they're tracking. Yeah. There, there's this, and he, he continuously questions whether or not it's a, a self-defense and animalistic hunting or a scientific curiosity that is behind the way things have been decimated every time the old ones seem to come in contact with the human encampments. He kind of attributes to them some of the same emotions that we've seen him describe having. This fear, this curiosity, this drive, they, he applies to them the same things he has. He once again equates humanity and them in a way I didn't expect. And I keep calling them old ones. I think that they were identified in the Necronomicon as elder things, which is another way of saying old, old ones. ones. But yeah. there's so many ancient weirdnesses in Lovecraft, they, they, get, they get hard to uh, keep them straight. This, at the, as they get closer, though, this does introduce one of the best Lovecraftian entities ever. What? The giant blind penguins. <laughs> <laughs> the giant blind and penguins that they start running into, which are a little bit too wrong and a little bit too creepy. And their description took me out of it for a moment because one part feels like H.P. Lovecraft went to the zoo one day and found penguin penguins creepy and wanted <laughs> to write this. And one part, I swear I've seen this thing as it's described on a T-shirt in Hot Topic. I think both of those things could be, be true. true. But yeah, that that's that is this story's one it's it's one resort to jump scare. It does. It jump scares you with a the penguin. Jump scare and it's a giant blind albino cave penguin that's living in these catacombs. And like a lot of jump scares. When was the last time albino cave penguin dropped an album? Because that sounds like an that sounds like an artist's name. Yeah. I swear that's a SoundCloud name. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Uh yeah. And it's so it's fun, but the uh, the problem is that as jump scares can do, yeah, you're scared for a moment, and then it takes you out of the story. Yeah, because you're thinking, oh, that was just a jump scare. It was just the cat. It was just the penguin. It's not really. Ha it doesn't really have any anything to do with the story. So, you yeah, know, it was fun as that was. I, I, it's I, not Lovecraft's finest point. Yeah, I didn't expect this book to end with with the same sort of attitude as watching a Five Nights at Freddy's speed run. Because <laughs> it gets that, because he, he, he attempts that jump scare like one, two more times, I think. In it, he brings up the penguins again later. I think he talks about a ridge being like penguin fringed, <laughs> yes. which is just the wildest <laughs> sentence. But it's like... The penguins stopped being scary. Every time you bring them up, I'm just out of it now. Oh, having mentioned a video game, about the this is now making me think, wouldn't this be a cool basis for like a roguelike game? It would just procedurally honestly. generate new structures for this weird maze city under the ice and the random encounters with giant blind albino penguins the or the random you know, tools and supplies they have been scattered yes. and dragged through this place and the occasional elder thing is fixing for a fight or who is trying to communicate or who knows what it's hard to do a roguelike where you literally can't kill certain of your enemies properly hmm. because i don't think th there's always the issue and I'm, I'm backing up the issue with cosmic horror and what those that's one of those big things that you know H.P. Lovecraft help found in such is that later adaptations have a problem I've described as giving Cthulhu a stat block. Yes. The moment Cthulhu or another great creature of this cosmos things has an HP bar, that HP bar can hit zero. 
and giving it that kind of mortality lessens it. It's the difference between our scared hero and our hero who is armed. And the moment you arm them, it changes it. And so you'd have to be careful building that, but it could work. You just really have to tone the fact that you can't actually defeat an old one, an, an elder thing, if you run into it. Well, I don't know. I mean, you're right about the problem with a lot of Cthulhu things. I, I read the original printing of the AD&D Deities and Demigods, which included the Lovecraftian stuff, before I had read a lot of Lovecraft. And I think it messed me up for really understanding Lovecraft, and I had to get beyond that and not think of Cthulhu as something with hit points. But when it comes to the Elder Things, they can die. They have burial practices. Good point. And if it can die, it can be killed. That's one of the things that makes this so different from some other things in Lovecraft is these are not utterly unknowable and utterly powerful things. You can almost approach them as they are something that humans could in theory evolve into. We're not going to involve we're not going to evolve into five-pointed symmetry, but we maybe sometime could evolve into something that can travel among the stars and last a long time when frozen in the ice. Who knows? Hmm. And yet they can die. I think the cosmic horror power of the Elder Things is how incredibly old their civilization is. And the fact that maybe they had a hand in guiding the evolution of life on Earth. Yeah. It's their, their influence as a species, not the incomprehensible power of any individual. Good point. Very good point. I'm still not sure I want a video game in which you can just defeat them if you have enough shotgun shells. Yeah. That would kind of undermine how impressive they are. But you could do something interesting about the fact that they are harmable in that sense. Yeah. It might never be a defeat, but it might be a drive away for now. Right. That would work. Or it's more of a kind of survival horror in that it's you need to run away and you need to avoid them. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, the ending is a little flat because they escape. Not many of them, but, I, but of course, our main character who's writing this. Although him not would have been an interesting twist. <laughs> and a couple of them, and they, they flee to the plane and get out of there and call off the whole thing. Yeah, so it's, it's Dreyer and the one graduate student who went with him. And, of course, it's not Lovecraft if it doesn't end with something that somebody saw that they literally can't describe. Yeah, that's a little... Because the, 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 the student, as they're flying through the pass to make it back to the, their, the camp, the student sees another one of these ice mirages in the sky. And he can't describe what it is, but it's something like even worse, and even weirder than anything they've seen before. And it totally snaps the mind of, uh, of this student. And they're in, the, in the final chase that... that as they're trying to get back to the airplane, and then later on in the airplane when the, the graduate student snaps, that's when you get the direct reference to Poe and, and Arthur Gordon Pym. And what's the phrase that they use? The cry or chant, Tekeli Lee, Tekeli Lee. Yeah. And that's like the only thing that the, the student will say about whatever it is he saw. So that's the typical Lovecraft. Well, I would tell you if I could, Good, but of but... course no one can because the one person who saw it is crazy or because I have no human words that could describe it. Human words were excellent at describing the entire history of these things <laughs> just a couple pages ago, but that one graduate student don't got any of them for this. Uh, yeah. So we've kind of talked about this structure and how it follows step by step. What's hard to convey is how all of this works as building blocks. That I, you feel like you're both you're going farther away and getting closed in by all of this detail that you get. First about the science and technology of the expedition, then about the discoveries that they're, they're making, then about what is discovered within the ancient city. There are times where the amount of extreme detail everything gets described with blurs. 
and it just becomes almost almost rhythmic in that sense. Every single thing is described with three adjectives, and so there's this beat and this pulse to it as you get from piece to piece, and that sinks in. And there's times when those blur together in a way that doesn't make them coherent to me all the time. If anyone who has ever uh, seen engineering things knows the joke of the turbo encabulator, which is just a sequence of uh, crazy descri- crazy phrases turned into a long sing- thing, a string of techno babble. There's things that can be kind of fun just listening to one of those <laughs> keep going. And there's something about the way that gets into this rhythm and gets you into this like weird mind space that I feel like this did the same, especially with an audio book where I could just sit there moving around tables, chopping some onions and listening. Going, <laughs> uh... For me, it was a night sitting down in a big chair with this book and a, uh, a glass of Elijah Craig next to me and just like sinking into this pit of words. Oh yeah. It was great. So I think we're coming up to our final comments there then. I think so. So I guess our first one is read or no read. I'm going to say read. I there I understand and there's good reasons for people who don't want to go into HP Lovecraft stuff about him and his history. If that sticks with you too much in a bad way, don't. If you're not a fan of that kind of creepy horror, it's not a gruesome horror, but it is a a terror kind of horror of the unknown, that cosmic kind of entity thing, it's not everyone's cup of tea. And if it's not, go find your cup of tea and enjoy your cup of tea. I love that kind of stuff. I sip that. That's my sort of thing. So I say read or listen or however you want to get this because it is fun. And I also think that if you like media, the way that this kind of Avengers MCUs all of the pieces of his other stuff and all these other things into this this grand history that can then spread backwards and let you think is also fun in that sense. I agree. I would say read this unless you know it's not your cup of tea or unless you have other objections to reading Lovecraft stuff. I totally get that as well. I don't think I would recommend this as the first Lovecraft story that anybody reads. Yeah, I know. Because it, this, it, it is hits so much better if you've already read at least the basics of the Cthulhu mythos. Call of Cthulhu, the Dunwich Horror, and and a few others. That's part of why I started this, making sure we'd connected to something other than this in H.P. Lovecraft's work before. Because you've got to at least have somewhere to get to here. Ironically enough, you've got to at least start your journey to the mountains somewhere else in it, and then get to the mountains of madness. <laughs> right. You don't want the first, to use your Marvel analogy, you don't necessarily want to start with the Avengers let alone yeah, you know, with the Avengers movie or Age of Ultron, you want to see where all of this came from first. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I would say definitely read, but read some of those others first. And, uh, and that leads to our second question. I believe that the special set of questions that you coined for novels, Ian, was add, adapt, or adios. Yes, I did. Ah. Do we want to something else in the same continuity? Do we want an adaptation of this, or do we want to say no? Let it let it be. Let's say goodbye to it. We'll revisit it when we want it, but we don't need new versions. There are so many, so many expansions that I think that the first one kind of already will always happen. <laughs> yes, and I also want to point out to that that if I don't look at that, ex- there's a bit of a, a crossing the line here between that add and that adios aspect that leave it alone and that add to it and that's where i say the format of this has been added to and expanded without the content because there's so much of this book that reminds me of modern internet horror i'm talking about the pets cops i'm talking about the the back rooms series of videos i'm talking about other video games like uh, the be- the secret lore things in Doki Doki Literature Plus. Yes. Things like that. The way this decides to incrementally give you this story that builds in this creepiness and gives you these pieces, I feel like the 
there's so much great versions of that out there on the internet that will have fun swapping up the order, giving you different pieces in different sequences. And this feels like that is what's one of the origin points for that sort of writing that th goes into those. So I think that format is thriving in a way it never has before even. And so it's going to keep on adding and I'm excited because I, I like watching and reading that kind of stuff and falling down a wiki hole and going, Neh, and then <laughs> getting a good night's sleep somehow. I think you're absolutely right. There is a direct similarity between the feel of reading at the Mountains of Madness and reading the best creepypasta that's <laughs> out there. Because it tends to be, well, let me tell you about this story, or let me tell you about this thing that happened to me. and Or maybe I should say that the best creepypasta acknowledges and, and learns from the tradition of stories like this. And yeah, I, I agree. I love that kind of stuff. I love that that literal creepy feeling that it can instill. So you're, the, the influence of this is unmistakable. And even on a more, in a more literal sense, there's so much else has been built on top of what Lovecraft has done. So many more stories about the elder things and the great old ones and the, and the, the, all of the, the Cthulhu cosmic mythos of, uh, of HP Lovecraft that, you know, the, the, that, that, that ship has sailed to the Antarctic and back. Yeah. Which leads me into the fact that Adapt is interesting here. Because I would honestly love to see an adaptation of this. So would I. I just don't know how or where. A movie would feel too contiguous. It would feel long and stretched out in some ways. I feel like sitting down and absorbing it all as a visual medium might not give you the right feeling. I'm wondering if a mini series might, but could a highly produ produced YouTube series do something right? Do a, like an online video where they put out little chapters of sections posted each time? Could that do? Is there things of the format of the newer stuff that could use this? I'm wondering. It's part of why I ponder. I definitely would love to see good adaptations attempted. But I want to see what you can play with if the space has already grown to give these options. I think you're right. I, I think you could make a good feature film based on this. I'm still kind of heartbroken that apparently we're not going to get the Guillermo del Toro version of this that's been promised for so long or talked about for so long. I shouldn't uh -huh. say promised. But, but that said, I, I'm with you. I'm not sure that a feature film is the best format for this. I find myself thinking about something that I've listened to and seen in the past year, and that is Archive 81, oh. which is, it started out as a podcast, which, or essentially, it's, it's a found, found tape style podcast where you're hearing recordings that are made over the course of somebody's work in digitizing recordings that turn out to have been a record of some weird paranormal shenanigans. And the Netflix series, based on it, inspired by it, is the same kind of overall structure. It's someone being hired to go to this remote facility to digitize these tapes that were damaged in the fire that burned down the New York apartment building that turned out to be the locus from, for some kind of supernatural shenanigans. Uh -huh. So... I could see that kind of episodic storytelling would be better for this than a feature film. I just don't know that it could be. You couldn't do it in the same kind of format as the podcast, where you're essentially getting actual reports from Dreyer during this expedition, because there'd be a little too much distance there. Yeah. I mean, at some point, with the last episode is his description to camera of all the stuff that they found there and occasional shots from his video camera. This is assuming that we're updating the setting, which is another tough thing. Yeah. There were no, there was no satellite imagery or flyover imagery of Antarctica in 1931. It was the remotest place you could imagine humans getting to. It, it it could be fun having that having that a modern version though where 
at the penguin jump scare, he drops his camera and you do a hard <laughs> pivot to the penguin picking it up with its beak. And the last video clip we see is the penguin's belly sliding itself back into <laughs> the impossible city. We only get a clip of and oh, it goes away. I like that. There's little things like you could do there, but yeah. <laughs> that would we, be fun just as a one shot. It really would. <laughs> There's things that we have done that make some of that Cthulhu mythos unknowable things harder to do which is why where we find our creepiness has shifted and some of that comes to we just have to change our, our sense of scale whatever our sense of scale is going to be it's still going to be smaller than cthulhu's smaller than the 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 hundreds of millions of years old elder things so of course one thing that comes up is well you can redo the mountains of madness but put it in space and some people say that's what ridley scott did in alien prometheus yeah and uh, kind of did yeah and some say well yeah just do the, make the mountains of madness but put it on the dark side of the moon yeah you could do that but again that's almost already been done that's kind of i think you mentioned this before that's kind of what 2001 does mm -hmm. it's about an ancient race that was here before we could imagine there having having been life there are so many ways in which at the mountains of madness has already influenced so much other media you could almost call some of those things partial adaptations it's almost like it's older than all of these <laughs> and it helped shape what they became <laughs> <laughs> that might sum it up yeah kind of i like that <laughs> well yeah it's hard to cap that so but yeah i'd say read this and enjoy the fact that it had so much influence but i'd like to see an adaptation but i'm not going to hold my breath I think we're in we're we're in consensus here about how we feel about it. So I think so. Well, I hope this warmed you up a little bit, Ian. <laughs> ah, yes. To Antarctica, I'll have to think of what to do next if the weather stays like it is. Yeah, there's. You know what? We've we've had a lot of cold. We've had a lot of fun adventure. There's. I think we should melt a lot of this ice. I think there's some aquatic that we can do. Huh. I think there's something that actually fits what we've just been talking about really well that i remember that i want us to talk about uh, are you ready to take a dive dad <laughs> i think so okay well that sounds like we're going to be back in a couple of weeks with another podcast i think it is in the meantime uh dad where can they find the the scratchings that tell of your current <laughs> tale you can find them all uh, at www.bymatthewporter.com and that'll have links to everything else i'm doing including a link to youtube where i am recording every movie and every meal i have at the alamo draft house in the draft house diary and ian where can people find you i can be found most places as item crafting as item crafting live on twitch and at itemcrafting.com and you can find the podcast at www.immproject.com, and that's where you can find links to all of our past episodes, including our episode about the Dunwich Horror and our episode about 2001 A Space Odyssey. You'll also find a link to our shop, where you can find t-shirts and coffee mugs and other fun things, a link to our Patreon. Thanks very much for anybody who can support us there, and you also get special bonus content if you do. And you'll find a link to our Discord and a link to our YouTube channel. So thanks very much, but most important, thank you for downloading, thank you for listening. We are really glad you're here, and we hope you'll join us again. In the meantime, go find something new to watch.